So as I mentioned before, um, one of the feature presentation speakers is Dr. Daniel Loveless. Um, he's going to be talking about some of the electrical engineering courses and department um, for the College of Engineering and Computer Science with UTC. All right, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, Angela. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, nice to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody. Um, as Angela mentioned, I am a associate professor of electrical engineering. Um, I have been at UTC for about six and a half years. Um, prior to me joining UTC, I was a research professor and a senior engineer at the Institute for Space and Defense Electronics at Vanderbilt. So I've been in an academic setting um, for a little over 11 years now. Um, I, I also got my graduate degrees at Vanderbilt and then my undergraduate degree at Georgia Tech. Um, I have been studying space environments and specifically the use of electronics and microelectronics, small electronics and space systems for the entirety of my career. Um, and I have uh, six and a half years ago had the opportunity to join UTC and start a program that focuses on the use of microelectronic systems in extreme environments. And those extreme environments predominantly mean uh, space systems in this context. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. Now, I'm not going to be talking about electrical engineering at large. I'm, I'm gonna be talking about one facet of electrical engineering um, that we focus on at UTC. There are many others, um, for example, um, one, one thing that may come to mind is, is uh, power transmission, for example. We have a, a, a very robust power transmission and generation program at UTC as well. Um, but this is an opportunity to talk about one specific avenue of what we study in electrical engineering and some opportunities that are present at UTC in this particular program. Um, so before I move to these several next slides, I want you to kind of visualize in, in, in your head what you might consider um, things about space systems that, that might kind of come to mind. And I've gathered several images that come to my mind immediately. And, and you'll see these kind of images in, in the popular news lately quite a lot, right? You know, images like this, which was, this is an artist's concept, but this is a mission that took place just a little over a week ago or that concluded a little over a week ago, part one of the mission, which was get the Perseverance Mars rover to the surface of Mars. And it landed ab about a week ago. And this is an image of, of exactly how it was landed by an autonomous vehicle. I mean, think of a drone. It's just a large drone that landed this amazing robot under the surface of Mars. Um, if, if we go to the next slide, you'll see um, a really neat image that I, I pulled from the uh, database at NASA for the Cassini orbiter. And this is, this is a spacecraft that is going around Saturn to try to learn a little bit more about the environment of Saturn. Remarkable image, I think. Gives us a, a, a new perspective of, uh, of, of some of the phenomena around, uh, around Saturn. Moving to the next image. Um, this is a, 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 one of my favorites because um, this is a, a very well-known space telescope that, that has been in orbit around the Earth for several decades at this point, way beyond the, the uh, estimated lifetime of this spacecraft. And I'm going to talk a little bit uh, in a moment about why that's so uh, phenomenal, really. But um, kind of, su suffice it to say, electronics are not meant to survive this long out, out of the, the uh, Earth's atmosphere. And so this is a really remarkable technology. It's been in operation and it's told us so much about, uh, about various science phenomena that's important for us to you know, understand why we're here and, and what's around us and, and um, things like that. It, um, there's a lot of really cool facts about the Hubble. I invite you to read a lot about it. It's about to be replaced by something called the James Webb Space Telescope, which is even more exciting. But this is sort of the, what people, a, a lot of people that I talk to envision when they think about spacecraft, right? A big giant telescope or other spacecraft. This is about the size of a bus that we put into orbit. It's very expensive. It, it was about a billion and a half dollars just to build this and get it launched in 1990, 
with 1980s technologies. Um, and, and it's been re-outfitted since then. A lot of money has been spent on it, but a lot of amazing science has been obtained from this. We're doing things a little bit different now. And so um, that's where our program um, and many other programs in the country, but our program specifically at UTC, which is one of a handful, there are less than six universities across the US that study the effects that I'm gonna be talking about in just a moment. Because one of the big questions are, we, ha we, we have these big exciting space missions. We have uh, in endeavors about sending humans into deep space and putting them on the moon and putting them on Mars. The question is, how do we do this in a reliable way? And what kind of technologies need to exist in order to make this happen? So next slide. Um, this is one that, that comes to a lot of people's minds um, lately. Uh, and, and for me, this was a really exciting moment. I remember watching this live and just being, a, my, my, my uh, jaw was on the floor, so to speak. This is not a rocket launching, this is a rocket landing. This was after flight. Um, this was, of course, from SpaceX. And SpaceX has been using these Fal Falcon 9 reusable rocket um, systems um, for a number of years now. Uh, and it's, it's just, it's a really exciting sort of endeavor. Now, of course, they're trying to do it with a much, much bigger system. If you've been paying attention to that, uh, uh, several days ago, I watched um, the latest uh, uh, SpaceX um, starship try, try to land and it landed and then had some problems. Um, the same thing happened with the Falcon 9s when they were doing this initially. A lot of them had trouble landing for a while. The technology was sort of optimized over time and now, now they're able to do this. And, and this is changing how we think about space systems moving forward. And so I also want to use this as an opportunity to talk about some of that. Okay, next slide. This is um, a short video that shows um, a, a pretty standard rocket. This is called an Atlas V that we use to get satellites into orbit. So this is a government rocket system that, that we use very, very frequently. Um, and that particular uh, rocket was launching a small satellite. Um, actually, Angela, if you could go back one slide real quick. Um, it, it's launching, uh, if possible, it's not, it's okay if not. This spacecraft that you see that's being launched by this vehicle can fit in the palm of your hand. It's 10 centimeters on the side. It's called a cube satellite. We are build, building these at UTC right now. This was the very first small satellite space mission that I was involved in a, a number of years ago, about eight years ago. Um, and we built a, 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 an experiment. This was cheap enough for us to build a spacecraft and send this to do an experiment in orbit. Um, and, and so this is what I mean by changing landscape. You know, we're not just having to conceive of billion and a half dollar missions the size of a bus. We can build spacecraft that fit in the palm of your hand and weigh less than four pounds. And we can do real science studies with these things. Okay, next one. I love this composite image. This, was a, this is two images superimposed by NASA because it's really the point of this image is to give you a perspective of what we're trying to do moving forward. We're in the process of building, uh, of conceiving ideas of how to um, colonize the moon, so to speak. We're gonna have a permanent presence, human presence on the moon starting in 20, 2024, 2024. We're, uh, a lot of science is going into to, to figuring out how to do that and how to sustain people on the moon. And the reason we're doing that is because we're thinking deep space, we're thinking about other, other planetary explorations. We're building spacecraft that are gonna be in constant orbit around the moon and can be bounced back and forth from the moon to the earth so that we can do deliveries in a more efficient way. All of the technologies that you've seen in the last several images are going into this. And it's, it's really exciting, right? This, is, this, this could be a landscape of the future that, that, is, that, is, a, that is not um, too far-fetched anymore. Okay, next slide. Okay, here's the problem. And, and when I started this program six and a half years ago at UTC, I felt this very acutely because I initially needed to, to attract graduate students to my program. And I needed a graduate students that could do research in these fields. Um, and many people are very excited, and these are the images that you, that you see when you think about it. These are the images you find when you do research online, but it's not clear how you go about obtaining a degree that can support 
your endeavors in space systems, right? I, I had students showing up saying, I don't know that this is right for me. I don't even know where to begin, right? Because this is what we see when we get our undergraduate degree in electrical engineering. This is what we study. And there's a good reason for this. This is fundamental theory stuff. Um, and we like to think, if we move on to the next slide, that by studying that, it becomes apparent that you can use these skills to be a part of really exciting missions like the Mars 2020 rover called Perseverance, right? And kind of we as electrical engineer nearing educators think this so, so much that even the last several textbooks, next slide please, use images of space systems to promote electrical engineering, right? So this, these are the last three editions of the electrical circuits textbook that is used by most universities in the United States to talk about fundamental circuit theory. The last three editions of this textbook, which by the way is a remarkable textbook. I use it, I teach with it, it's very good. They all use very similar images, but nowhere in this textbook does it talk about how you use electric circuits and build spacecraft or build systems that can operate in very harsh conditions reliably for long periods of time, right? We kind of have an idea that if we look at our cell phones, for example, there's a lot of really great technology in these cell phones. They can do a lot of amazing things. And we know that electrical engineers are fundamental to making that happen. But we don't quite understand, you know, if we fly this cell phone, it's not going to last. It's not going to, it may not even make it into orbit before it fails. You know, the, the, these technologies are not really meant for this. And we have to think about the problem in a fundamentally new way. Okay, next slide, please. And so this is what my laboratory studies and, and what the new curriculum that we're developing is focused on. We look at the space environment in a little bit different way, right? It's not this empty vacuum. It is vacuum, but it's not empty that, that we send something in, take pretty pictures with, right? It, 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 it's a very dynamic and harsh environment. This is an artist rendering of what some of those concerns that we think about um, are. From the sun, the sun is not emitting just electromagnetic radiation that we see and we feel the warmth of, it, it emits ionizing radiation, which is energetic particles that are traveling at the speed of light towards us and are very harmful, right? We've adapted to this as the human species we, we uh, the, the, uh, the magnetic field lines of the earth, which are drawn in these pictures, protect us from this quite a lot. Our atmosphere protects us. Most of this harmful radiation coming from, from the sun gets deflected around our magnetic field lines. Some of it gets trapped in those magnetic field lines though. And so we have these, around the earth, we have these sort of dense areas of heavy radiation that are present and particles are traveling through that. We spin, send spacecraft into that environment, that spacecraft is going to be exposed to incredible levels of radiation. If we go outside of those belts, we see a little bit of a different environment. We can see just random particles coming from deep space, maybe from another star, maybe from a supernova some, somewhere billions of years ago. It, 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 we, we see a, a just a really dynamic and intense environment and it, and it can contain a lot of different types of things. So what, what we study in my laboratory is what are those environments? How can we use knowledge of those environments to predict what we're going to, to, to predict the type of effects that we're gonna see in the systems that we're using for studying space science and for sustaining life when we go outside of the atmosphere of earth. Okay, next slide, please. And everybody here knows a little bit about this already. And we, we know this in, in sort of dramatic ways that we see on earth. And so this is a picture of, or two pictures actually, of the Northern Lights. The left was a picture uh, taken by a US airman, um, most likely somewhere in Alaska um, of the Northern Lights. This is kind of the quintessential picture that, that we see. Northern Lights is this uh, magical thing. Very recently, a, a cousin of mine who lives in that region as well took this from his back porch about two weeks ago. 
right? This is this this is unedited sort of visualizations of what we really see constantly. And the reason you see this when you get towards the poles of the earth is because those magnetic field lines that I just showed you on a cartoon kind of converge and they get lower towards the ground. And what you're seeing are all of those trapped particles that I just mentioned that the magnetic field lines kind of contain. You're seeing that in a visualization, right? You're seeing the energy the trapped energy of all of that ionizing radiation being trapped in our field lines and moving around. And that kind of causes this really interesting visualization when you're underneath it. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and I think if you hit one more time, that video would play. So now this is a, a short video of um, a camera. It's called a charge coupled display that is focused on the sun. The reason you're not seeing is the sun is because we blocked that sun out um, right in the middle. And, and we did that so that we could study what's called the corona of the sun just outside of the edge of the sun. Okay. And so the spacecraft that took this video is, is called SOHO. And it's a European Space Agency NASA collaboration. And it's there to study the corona of the sun. And so what you just witnessed, and I think if maybe if you go hit back arrow, it should play that again, or you can click the little arrow over if you hover over the video. Uh, and what you'll see is two bursts that happen. Okay, you'll see this one burst, maybe, maybe yeah, thank you. You'll see one, one burst that happened on September uh, 4th, I think, and then another burst that happened on September 6th. This is a coronal mass ejection. A bunch of protons and other stuff was emitted from the sun. And you start seeing these speckles happen all over the camera. And then even the camera starts failing. And then several of the pixels, you see this black stripe that shows up. Okay, this is an example of an effect of ionizing radiation impacting an electronic system. So this is a transient phenomenon in most of the cases. We see these little white streaks go through the camera, disrupting the pixel. That data is gone. It's just, it just goes away it, and, and until we can rewrite that data. Um, but it's, it's usually recoverable. Well, you also see this sort of unrecoverable stuff. The camera is starting to degrade and it looks like it may be permanently being damaged, okay? This is what we have to combat when we're sending electronic systems into heavily radioactive environments that are present in outer space. And by the way, this phenomenon is exactly what you have to worry about if you're building an electronic system that's at a nuclear power plant or at a particle accelerator at CERN or at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory or at a medical facility. We use ionizing radiation to treat cancer. Um, you, you have to worry about this type of stuff impacting electronics. And those electronics are important. They're doing things that not only helping us discover science phenomena, but for example, helping treat people that, 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 that need treatment um, from cancer or, or some other uh, issue. Um, th th this is important for, for electronics that are not even exposed to heavy environments of radiation, but you and I right now in this moment are having thousands of particles go through our bodies constantly. It, there's a background level of radiation that we are always exposed to and, and we're adapted to this. Our skin helps us and protects us. Well, what if you have a defibrillator in, in to help regulate in case your heart has an arrhythmia or uh, you know, if, if, if that, that piece of electronics is, is a critical life-saving device and we, we can't have that be disrupted by this type of mechanism. Um, so just another little example of, of one of the things we might study. And the reason this is really cool is sort of pictured in this image. So I, I took this, uh, the, the original image from Intel, which talks about how electronics technology has improved over the last 50 years. Okay, basically since electronics started becoming commercialized until near present. And this, I've got about, I'm about five years out of date. I got a update that red line a little bit, but you see this amazing steady decrease in the size of our electronics with time and it's very regular. And there, we, I can do an entire course on that phenomenon. But one thing that's really interesting about that is no other technology known to man works this way. Not only can we improve it and it shrinks when we improve it, but it gets cheaper per sort of computation, per, per, per element um, as we do so. 
it's it's really remarkable and because of that all all of a sudden life as we know it is completely different right we we can do things that we didn't we couldn't do 50 years ago you have the power of the apollo spacecraft actually probably two apollo spacecrafts and this that put people on the moon your cell phone is is probably an order of magnitude more computationally uh, capable than the Apollo spacecraft, which was hand wired with magnetic elements. Um, it, it, this phenomenon is really remarkable. And to put it in perspective, if I scaled the Empire State Building to 10 micrometers, which was the size of a transistor in 1970, to the size of about today, which really today is about five nanometers, but let's say it's 10 nanometers just to, to make math easy. That's like shrinking the Empire State Building to the size of a dog. Okay, and, and the, the thing about that is it's, it's not a model. It's like, it's the same device. And in, in fact, it's even better than the original in a lot of ways. But what we can do with that is we can stack them and we can pack up that same amount of area that we had 50 years ago with a bunch more devices and all of a sudden we have computational power, right? This is the enabling thing. That's just what electrical engineering in a nutshell studies okay, is this phenomenon. And then my laboratory specifically studies how these devices can be arranged in a way to be robust to really tough situations. Okay, next slide, please. So my laboratory is called the Reliable Electronics and Systems Lab. We study microelectronics, these devices, and then how we arrange these devices and what we call embedded systems that we use in everyday life. Um, about 90% of my lab studies the, the effect of ionizing radiation on this, these types of technologies and reliability concerns. Um, we have a, a more a, a growing cohort of security problems, though. Uh, the, not only the reliability of those devices, but how secure and um, trustworthy are our devices. And we have some really innovative techniques for sort of identifying and, and verifying these devices. And these individual sort of science studies feed into the realization of systems, reliable systems. And with that, we, we do things like build small satellite systems or deploy our devices in other types of situations like for studying energy efficiency in buildings. And we have some, some programs and uh, a lot of recent papers on how to do that. Um, we've also deployed it in um, health context as well with different partnerships. Um, we have a lot of partners, um, as, you, as you see, a lot of collaborators within the College of um, Computer Science and Engineering at UTC, but also across, across campus and then with other universities. Some of our other university partners involved are uh, Vanderbilt, Georgia Tech, where we've been partnering with ASU, um, Purdue, um, New Mexico State, Brigham Young University. There's a lot of partners uh, these days that we continuously work with. And we have a lot of government partners as well as you imagine with radiation effects studies and space environments. The government is very interested in what we're doing and, and they, they fund us quite a lot. And we've partnered with industry as well, locally, um, electronics manufacturers locally, as well as um, regionally and nationally. Um, I also am the, uh, the, the thrust lead of a research um, center at the uh, internal SIM center um, at, at, you know, at, at UTC. And this is really the research enabler. This is where we sort of fuel our research um, endeavors. And so you can kind of look into that a little bit as well. That's called an envir uh, extreme environment technologies at the SIM center. Okay, next slide, please. Um, we we uh, uh, consequently, with all this research, it's not just research, we're fueling curriculum development and, and experiment, experiential learning programs at the undergraduate and the graduate level. Um, we, we call this that particular program that sort of off sh sh shoots from my laboratory, UT ChatSat. Um, um, but we also, so, so uh, we have an undergraduate research experience program in the summer. We have a year long version of this. We have various courses at both graduate and undergraduate levels um, that do this. These are images that some of my students took with technologies they built and flew on a suborbital high altitude balloon. So these are, these are our images uh, at about 100,000 feet above the Earth's uh, surface. Um, and during the solar eclipse 
for a couple of year, years ago as well. So a lot of really neat stuff, a lot of people involved. Um, we just started another program called Scale, and this is where we partner with a lot of universities across the country. This is fueling just a lot of students. Scale tends to be limited to U.S. citizens, but the program at large is not. Um, so we have both. Um, no, no need to worry about that. Um, there's pretty much something to do for everybody, depending on your background and your interests. Um, and as you can see, this sort of summarizes what we try to do with scale in, in my program at large. We have STEM outreach programs, we have community college programs, we have undergraduate um, internship placement. We have about 50 internships available per year that we peak place people. Um, these are funded internships. We've, we have a lot of people at, that go to NASA, that go to JPL, that go to Northrop Grumman, that go to um, Virgin Galactic and SpaceX and places like that. And then we fuel all of these projects uh, kind of funnel into our graduate program, which is, which is sort of funded and fueled by uh, sponsored research from the government. So final slide I've got for you today sort of summarizes that and what's available um, as a part of the radiation effects and reliability studies at, in the electrical engineering department at UTC. So with that, I thank, your, thank you for your attention. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask or just reach out to me directly. I'm happy to answer your questions at any time.